something that intrigues me about humans, about just our nature, is that we don't particularly care for ambiguity. We like things to be clear, and we like things to have nice, neat, tidy endings that wrap up, and we prefer them to be happy endings, too. But at the same time, we can't help but be drawn to novelty and mystery. And like those cliffhangers, we hate them, but we really love them because they, they work, but we hate them because they work. But they're just, they're captivating to us. Our brains, they just love to fill in the blanks. You know how uh, some horror movies, they're, they're almost more terrifying if they don't show what actually happens. Because your brain will just fill it in. And your vivid imagination will get going. That's one reason I love um, the concept of six-word stories. Have you ever heard of those? It was kind of a fad a few years ago and stuff, but I just, I love them. They're what they call microfiction. It's an entire story in six words. And probably the most famous example, it's attributed to Ernest Hemingway, although we don't really have any evidence of that. But it is a memorable story. Six words. It goes, for sale, baby shoes, never worn. It takes a minute, right? And then you're like, oh, when that was a roller coaster ride of emotion in six words. And, and really, what was unsaid was more the story than what was said. I found a, a couple other favorites I just had to share with you because I just love these. Um, brought roses home, keys don't fit. Takes a second. Sorry, soldier. Shoes sold in pairs. Oh, right? Wow. My favorite. Torched the haystack. Found the needle. It takes a second, right? They're so good. They're so good. I just love that. And that one could go so many different ways, and so your mind just goes wild. But something, sometimes it is about those things that are not said, those blanks that we have to fill in. And I think that's one of the reasons why I, I love this passage of Matthew and why I'm always returning to this. Um, we started this series last week. See, the gospel according to Matthew begins with a genealogy, which is a standard biblical term, and we find it in several other places, where they list names, you know, like a family tree, but just going down one line. And this one leads to Jesus Christ. And it starts with Abraham. So it's a long list. But as we looked at it last week, we discovered there was a few unusual things in this list. Let me refresh our memory. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron was the father of Aram. Aram was the father of Amminadab. Amminadab was the father of Nashon. Nashon was the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. 
already, we've, we've seen two anomalies. And if you read the whole thing, we find a couple more. There's actually five women's names in this list. One of them is Mary, Jesus' mother. And these four others are taking us back to stories in the Hebrew Bible. And so we talked about Tamar last week. We started spicy. Um, today's a little less spicy, ironically. Um, but we're going to talk about the story of Rahab this morning. And her story comes in in Joshua chapter 2. I'm going to read a little bit directly from the text, and then I'm going to actually retell it um, in a different order, because the way that the story is told is really, it's, it's pretty cool for, for reading. Um, but it's also, since it's not our culture, kind of hard to figure out, because they don't tell it chronologically. And so they say, and this happened, but don't worry, this already happened. And then we're back in the future, and then there's a flashback. And so it's kind of hard to tell what happened in what order. And so I'll, I'll do that. I'll break and then tell it in chronological order. The setting here is coming to the conclusion of the 40 years that the Israelites spent wandering in the wilderness under the leadership of Moses. Moses has just died. And just before his death, he passed on the leadership role to Joshua. So Joshua's job, see, they've, they've gotten to the edge of the promised land. They've seen it. Moses has seen it. And, and God said, now, it's yours. But it's kind of inhabited already. And so that's an issue, and they're going to have to conquer this land. And it happens to be a land of people called the Canaanites, and the main city is Jericho. It is, there's still ruins of Jericho that you can see today. It is a um, beautiful, heavily fortified ancient city known for its walls. Ancient cities had walls around them. That was their main form of protection. And these were, were especially daunting. These walls, it was really like two walls, concentric circle kind of arrangement, where the walls could be 12 to 15 feet wide on the inside. So they were actually homes and people who lived inside those walls. And... Joshua says, first, we need to gather some intelligence. So beginning at uh, verse 1 of Joshua 2, Joshua Nun's son secretly sent two men as spies from Shittim. He said, go, look over the land, especially Jericho. They set out and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab, they bedded down there. That's verse 1, and a lot has already happened. And I wanted to point out a couple of things. So, as I said, ironically, not as spicy as last week, but the fact that Rahab is a prostitute is not in question. It's, it's not a debate at all. It's clearly stated in the text. But you know that that's not deter people from arguing about it. In fact, the early church fathers, as we call them, some of those early writers in the second and third centuries, and even um, the uh, rabbis in Jewish history were, were uncomfortable with this fact. And, and actually, some of them wrote down that well, that's not exactly true. See, she was an innkeeper. And they come up with some interesting ways to 
kind of, you know, explain that. So they're clearly uncomfortable with her profession. And some argue that the reason is simply to underline the fact that she is from a poor family, that she lives in poverty, and thus had limited choices, which is, to this day, often the case. And that she was forced into this business, and thus one of those um, community members that is not chased out, you know, it's kind of a community service sort of a thing where they let it go, you know, they're like, I mean, what I'm saying is it's a two-way street here. The business does not work unless you have customers, right? And that's my other point here, is it, may, it gets hugely focused on Rahab the prostitute, Rahab the prostitute, always Rahab the prostitute. Even though she's the protagonist of the story and, and we go on to, you know, she is uh, amazing and changes the course of history here, it's always Rahab the prostitute. But I would like you just to, to think about that one verse again. The verse where it says, he sent the spies, go look over the land, and the first place that they go is Rahab's house, the prostitute's house. Some commentators have said, well, clearly that was for information purposes. So the Hebrew words that are translated here, they bedded down, is very much like some of our expressions today. You know, they went to bed. It could literally mean they went to a bed and fell asleep. But it can also be a euphemism. They slept together. Again, well, I mean, technically you could mean just sleep, but usually not. So, why? Why do we always focus on Rahab the prostitute and not on the fact that these two good Hebrew boys are sent as spies to gather intelligence? a very serious job, and decide that the place where they will start gathering intelligence is the prostitute's house, where they bed down. Let's just keep that in mind, shall we? Okay. Now, the story gets, like I said, a little, a little out of order and a little hard to keep up with, but... Here's what happens. The spies arrive at Rahab's house. They bedded down there. And at some point, Rahab discovers who they are, that they are Israelites, that this is a people that they have been hearing a lot about that is rumored to be on their way to conquer them. And she knows that they're camped not real far off. And she has heard about what their God has done for them in all of these ways. The Exodus stories coming out of Egypt and all that. And she, for some reason, decides, I want to be on their side. I want their God to be my God. And so she tells the spies, I will get you out of here safely. Because I think she knew that they had already been spotted or it wouldn't be very long. I'm imagining that they weren't very good spies um, in disguise department anyway. Because they get spotted very quickly. And before that happens, Rahab says, 
I want to give you information. And she gives them this information that everybody's heard about it, that her people are scared to death, that they're probably not even going to put up much of a fight. And then she says, since I have done you this favor, will you please, in return, spare me and my family? Because I know your God is the God, the creator of heaven and earth. And they agree. So right about then, the king's men come knocking at the door. She goes to the door. She hid them up on the roof underneath some flax stalks, a type of grain that in the process of its uh, turning from plant to bread uh, or other goods that you can use has to be washed and dried and laid out in the sun. So she's put it up there, she's hid them underneath that, and she comes to the door, and they say, King orders, send them out. Send out those two Israelite spies. She said, well, um, yes, I mean, they were here, but I didn't know who they were. And they left. They, they left just before the gate closed. I guess, well, probably if you hurry, you could maybe catch up with them. And the king's men buy it. And they take off outside the city gates. She comes back in, and she says to the spies, what you need to do is I'm going to lower you down out the window, because she had a window that faced that was on the outside wall and said, you need to go in this direction, stay in those woods over there for three days, they'll have given up, and then it'll be safe for you to return to your camp across the Jordan. And before they do that, they give her a red thread or cord, something, and tell her, tie this in the window and get all your family inside. Your father, your mother's family, your, your brothers and sisters and families, get them all in here. And as long as you put this in the window and stay inside this house, everybody in here will be spared. They will be safe. And so she lets them down. They do as she directs stay in the other direction, in the woods, hiding three days. Then they go back to Joshua at the camp, and they tell him, it's in the bag, we've got this, no problem. And they make their preparations. And in the intervening chapters, uh, the next few chapters describes what all of that looks like and how that story of the they circle Jericho so many times for six days, and then on the seventh, and the trumpets, and all of that excitement happens. Um, and then in chapter 6, returns to Rahab, and the spies prove true to their word, and take in, uh, keep safe Rahab and all of her family. Now, all of her family could mean a hundred people, the way they described families and the way it says basically her clan. So, uh, in fact, some of the, the rabbis said it might have been 200 people that escaped death because of her action. Now, that's a cool story and all. I mean, lots of fun details. But my question just keeps being why, not because, just because that that's me and I'm always asking why, but why? Why would she turn on her people? Why would she risk being caught as a traitor and exposed that she'd given them information and let them, you know, 
provided for their escape? Why would she do that? I was thinking about how much time had, had to have elapsed in between, and so I added up in the, the chapters and the events, had to have been at minimum three weeks. Keeping a secret like that for three weeks? And I'm wondering at what point she told her family, because I bet she's got a sister that, you know, if I tell just my sister and tell her not to tell anybody, then she's going to go, well, I didn't tell anybody except my brother-in-law. And then, you know, everybody's going to know. So unless her family was unusually good at keeping secrets, I don't know how she pulled that off. What would make her do that? And the only clue in the text is that she says, I heard what your God had done for you. I heard what your God has done, and I believed. She heard and believed. But she didn't just believe. She took action. She says that other people knew this as well. I mean, they had the same intel she did, that, that the Israelites were coming, that a takeover was likely. But she believed and acted bravely and righteously. To our whole reason for looking into this, which is through the lens of Matthew. Why, Matthew, do you point us at Rahab? Why, Matthew, do you put her name in here? What is it you're trying to communicate to us? Perhaps, perhaps it is taking belief and, and doing bravely. Belief into behavior, faith into action. That sounds like a Matthew thing that he would encourage. Maybe though, especially in light of last week and the weeks to come, we got another spicy one next week. Maybe, maybe Matthew is saying, that righteousness, that extraordinary faith, can come from the least likely places and people. See, there's so many layers to this story, and trust me, I'm leaving out a ton for which you are very grateful, because, you know, Super Bowl food and all that. So... There's much, 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 much more that could be said about the story. But I'll just share one thing that I learned. There's lots of allusions, references to the Exodus story here. You know, the, the slavery in Egypt and the escape from that, the Passover specifically. Lots of references to the Passover here. And what Rahab did was a radical act of civil disobedience, right? She disobeyed a direct order from her king in order to spare lives, to save, at significant risk to herself. And there were these midwives in Egypt, Shifra and Pua, who also disobeyed a direct order from the Pharaoh. They were ordered to kill every Hebrew baby boy. And when 
that did not appear to be occurring, they were called in in front of the Pharaoh who demanded why, why they were not complying with his direct order. And they said, the, the Hebrew moms are just, you know, they're just really strong and healthy and the babies are always born before we get there. They, like Rahab, lied. They disobeyed for a greater purpose, a purpose to save life. The red cord reminds us of blood smeared over the posts to spare life. You know, all of those things in this story remind us that Rahab is in a way a midwife to the Israelites. She enables them to inhabit this new place and start a whole new life in the promised land. So Matthew, what are you up to? I think at least part of it is to remind us or encourage us to question, are there people who are maybe on the fringes of society, people who by their profession or uh, nationality or whatever it is are not generally considered as credible, as worthy. And might they have an incredible faith? The capacity for courage to share a message with us? Did we say we might learn from unexpected people? I think Matthew wants us to be open to the unexpected. And that God's messages don't only always, in fact, in the Bible, less often than not, they come through those we least expect. Those we think, now, now, why would they know? We're the ones that we don't even think to listen to enough to dismiss. Her story tells us that God's saving grace might just come in the least expected people and places. If you are a guest with us today, thank you for being here, for uh, taking a chance here this morning. Uh, all of you who are joining us online, thank you for making this a priority in your morning. We appreciate you being here. And we want everyone to know that we are on this journey together. We don't claim to be perfect but we're committed, and we're committed to doing this thing called being Christian together in this community. And so if you need a community of faith, if you're looking for a church home, we would invite you to consider joining with us. If that means uh, coming from another place, or you've moved, or, uh, or perhaps giving your life to Christ for the first time, We'd love to celebrate that with you. And so uh, come and share that with me if you'd like to make that decision today. Or you can contact me during the week. Um, reach out and let me know, and I can help you with that. So 
let us conclude our time together in song. Would you stand and sing? God forgave my sin in Jesus' name. I've been born again in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name, I come to you to share his love as he told me to. Freely, freely, you have received. Freely, freely, give. Go in my name, and because you believe, others will know. Stories have so much power. And if we share, we can see what happens when someone hears and believes what God has done can change the world. So go believe what God has done and tell others what God has done so that they might too believe and save the world. Go in peace.